Welcome to the Finding Free Thought podcast. This podcast is funded by you. To support our work, please consider making a purchase from our Free Thought shop. Check out my campsite at campsite.bio/goodresonance, where you can follow me on social media, make a donation, and subscribe to my newsletter. Check out my essential oils offerings and grab my restorative teas ebook. Please subscribe to the audio version of this podcast on Apple and Podbean, and the video version on YouTube and Rumble. Be sure to check out my six-episode sci-fi comedy series, Simon Essler's Dystopian Imaginarium, along with my 60-minute comedy special, Theorize About Conspiracies, and my three-season hit show, Worlds Within, all on Rise TV. And don't forget to hit up simonessler.com for all of my work, to join my newsletter, for links to purchase my NFTs, make donations, and follow me on all social media. You can also join my Locals community, Team Free Thought, at teamfreethought.locals.com where I'll be offering subscribers previews of new sketch comedy material, documentary work, and private broadcasts for supporters only. As a member of Team Free Thought, $5 a month gets you all of that, plus a 15% discount at the Free Thought Shop. Hello, friends, and welcome to the show. Today we have a guest. His name is Dr. Benjamin Alter. He's an awesome guy. Him and I really connected online, and We've sort of been meaning to do this for a while, and so I'm just going to read his bio out, and then we're going to jump into the show. Dr. Benjamin Alter is a licensed naturopathic physician and founder of Alter Health, a virtual hub of experiential health education centered around whole food, plant-based nutrition, and lifestyle medicine. Dr. Ben's mission is to empower people to reclaim health naturally, freeing themselves from the sick care system, mainly through education and support proved through the Thrive on Plants program. When not serving clients at Alter Health, you'll find Dr. Ben enjoying whole food plant-based meals with his wife, partner, and best chef in town, Dr. Susanna Alter. Dr. Ben is also a lover of the outdoors, seeking adventure by foot, bike, or skis in the Colorado Rocky Mountains. So, without further ado, I give you our interview with Dr. Ben. Enjoy. All right, welcome to the Finding Free Thought podcast. Uh, Today, we are going to dive into free thinking around food and plant-based eating, and we have Dr. Ben Alter with us. Thank you for joining us on the show. We're so glad to have you. Welcome. Thank you so much. Such an honor and joy to talk to uh, to you guys. I feel like I know you, even though this is our first time connecting. And I feel like I just want to hang out with you, which I guess that's what we're doing here. It's true. You know, we've said the same thing where it's like we could probably just hang out. You know, <laughs> it seems like there's there's good vibes there. And I think, uh, you know, it's been what we wanted to do this a while ago and things got too chaotic. And so we're glad to finally have landed in the space to do it. And, uh, you know, I think this is a really, really interesting time in terms of diet and eating and, you know, health freedom when it comes to eating. And I think that's the biggest thing that we've found is that connecting to plants as both food and medicine has really opened up a space for health freedom, less reliance on the medical system. And, uh, you know, we were interested in, in just starting, I guess, uh, with your own personal journey, like how you arrived in the space of health freedom through plants and plant-based eating and what that was like for you. Yeah. Well, to be honest, I feel like they don't really overlap in my personal experience too much. It's like I eat to feel good and it just is common sense that feeling good is our birthright and we should be in control of how we feel good and what feels good for one person might not feel good for another person. So it's like, you know, decision-making and informed consent has always been such common sense. Um, and I guess my, my journey into plant-based eating has just been, been, you know, no one told me, Oh, eat a plant-based diet because it's going to be good for you. Um, it was more of just self-exploration and I studied nutrition before I went to naturopathic medical school. And um, in my nutritional studies, it was just about that kind of self-experimentation. And I actually got, <clears throat> I guess this was like 12 years ago. I was, um, I, I got, I crossed paths with David Avocado Wolf at the time. And he was like a, a, an early inspiration in the nutrition world. 
And, you know, he was all about the raw veganism. And I, you know, before I knew it, I was essentially like a raw vegan. And I'm like, how did this happen? And I was feeling really great and, uh, you know, super jazzed and inspired by the food, food that I was eating and connected with my nutrition. Um, and I, I, if I'm going too, too deep, too fast, just pull me back. But what, before I knew it, I was actually like after a year or so pretty depleted nutritionally. And I realized that, oh, you know, like, sure, you can eat healthy food, but like, there's more to it, you know, you've got to do it properly. Um, so when I started my studies in naturopathic medical school, um, actually, in that profession, in that world, there's a lot more of a paleo ideology, if you'd believe it, um, even though a lot of the early naturopathic doctors were very much whole food plant based uh, nutrition folks. Um, but in any event, you know, the paleo ideology really kind of, I, I wouldn't say I kind of like fell into it, but it rubbed off on me, started drinking bone broth and like, you know, doing, doing the things and, and felt better, you know, felt like I, I was like missing something and I was like, okay, I'm feeling better. And then I felt depleted again. And I realized that essentially I just have to eat more good stuff. And I was just in a, in a state of, calorie energy depletion. And I was, you know, I wouldn't say that I had like an eating disorder because there was no, it was, I just was eating what I was served. I, I didn't have that strong of a connection with my body and my hunger and my appetite. And, um, as I started to learn more about nutritional biochemistry, about how food becomes energy in our bodies. And, and it's like, oh, I need to put a lot of that in my body. And I started to kind of develop this new relationship with food and nourishment. And now I feel awesome. And, you know, I'm super active and, um, yeah, plant-based is, is, uh, is, as you were saying, Simon, um, is helping me maintain my freedom. And in the sense that's like, you know, independent of the system that wants to keep me sick. Yes. I'm one of those people who thinks that the system wants me to be sick. Um, and my freedom is in my control. And, you know, unfortunately doctors aren't trained to give you your health. You know, that's just not the system. Yeah. Interesting. Amanda, you had a really similar experience actually. Yeah. I had a similar experience with the raw vegan diet as well very sick, had collapsed bowels and liver malfunction and different things like that. Just malabsorption of nutrition. And yeah, it took a few years to figure it out, <laughs> like what was right for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the one size fits all uh, sort of way. Um, it seems is not very healthy. It's very dangerous. Um, if you're making, I guess, a mental decision about, oh, yeah, this looks healthy. Some people have been eating raw or paleo, like you mentioned. We've known a bunch of people who've felt better and then worse with that as well. Um, because for me, it was all mental driven. It wasn't about body awareness. It was when my body started to malfunction, I still persisted with, well, this is so and so is successful with this. So I should keep trying. Um, and so at some point along the line, I had to like stay in my body and decide that what was healthy for me. Um, and it sounds like you've gone through some of that as well, just through your experimentation. Was there anything that stood out in terms of like a modality of like getting more in touch with your body? And like, how do you know what is sort of healthy for you, I guess? <laughs> That's a darn good question because yeah, there's so many modalities and practices and, and things that one might do to connect with the body. And I mean, I've done a lot of experimentation with food and other things and, and whatnot. And um, <clears throat> I think that essentially, I guess my answer to your question is that uh, we all are on this journey of connecting with ourselves and um, knowing ourselves and what that means is, um, of course, knowing ourselves and like our emotional, energetic kind of self-awareness, but also our physical body self-awareness. And I think that a lot of times, like there's this 
desire to like speed up this process of like healing, you know, healing is a destination or self-awareness is this destination that if only we can just get to as quickly and straightforwardly as possible. Um, but I don't know if that's the way it is. It's just like, it's, it's not a pro it's not a destination. It's the journey. Um, so of course, like I'm sitting here with you talking about, oh, this is where I've come and this is where I am today. And I know all this stuff and I have all this experiment experience, um, but I'm in the middle of it, you know? So I don't know where I'll be next week. I'll probably be somewhere new and in a deeper place of understanding and connection, you know, at least that's my intention. And um, so, yeah, I guess that's kind of the relationship that I have now with myself and the healing process. And in life in general is just kind of like, you know, being so open-minded, like I would say, you know, radically open, open-minded. And I think the, the last uh, craziness of the, over, over the last couple of years or so has just helped me to keep my mind open to the infinite possibilities rather than like latching on to figuring, needing to figure things out, needing to know things and just being in the, the great unknown, the vast unknown. Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I just to give you guys kudos in the free thought thing. It's just like so resonant. You know, it's like, what a great place to be in just this unknown and unattached and curious and open to being wrong, open to be proven wrong, open to be finding out new things. And it's it's exciting. It's exciting and adventurous rather than like, oh, I know everything because I read it in a book and this is t person told me that. And that's like, that's boring. <laughs> that's boring. That's lame. That's bland. So I'm on the adventure. Yeah, I really resonate with that because I think a lot of people, especially a lot of people who have woken up to, you know, larger actual conspiracies and things like that over the past few years, they, they've come to that through open mindedness. You know, they were open enough to sort out, hey, maybe there's something bigger going on. And so I think a large portion of the population has that open-mindedness, but the trap with that seems to be that sometimes we get stuck trying to know too much. And it's true that resting in not knowing, staying open, staying curious, I think uh, is a really good practice for people that have awakened to some of these greater possibilities. And, and that can really be balanced by not trying to be absolutely certain about everything, about what's going on. I mean, if we've learned anything from the past few years, it's like, you can't really know what's coming next. It's quite unpredictable how things are about to unfold, you know, in a number of ways. And I found that really, really helpful myself. And I think when it comes to eating, the mental knowing can be very, very tricky. It can be very, like it can mislead people. Like if you go into a diet only with the mind and with no body awareness, I think it can, uh, I mean, it might be the thing that ends up pushing you into body awareness because you might get sick enough that you have to pay attention to your body. And sometimes that's what does it for people. Sometimes the anchor into the body is the illness, ironically enough. And I don't know, have, have you had any link, anything like that with clients? Like, do people arrive in your space sort of struggling with, you know, physical illness? But is that also maybe what's bringing them to their body or to that availability to the body? I think that everyone has their own kind of wake up moment. Right. And, um, you know, I, th I think that you, you bring up a good point and that, you know, is the way that I like to encourage people to look at their symptoms and illness as really just like, you know, messages from the body and like the body doesn't have judgment, you know, the, the pain in the neck or the knee or the it, gut issues. That's not like your body rebelling. That's your body doing what it's designed to do. And we can't get upset with our body or like feel like oh st just stop it just get better we have to like get curious like what is our body telling us um and of course because when we like get frustrated with our body that just creates more tension you know that just blocks the healing potential even more um so that's like the starting point is just that kind of curiosity and uh, open-mindedness to what our body is communicating with us so, you know, we had this experience of you know, conceiving and bringing into the world vegan children, but this was a very interesting thing in terms of the propaganda that exists in the world, right? At the time that we were having our first 
uh, son, Asher, there was still articles coming into the world saying, uh, you know, vegan parents kill their child from malnutrition. And, uh, yes, I just right. saw one too, two days ago. Well, and yeah. you know, I've noticed this because in, in the events of the world, a lot of people have been pushed more towards the right, politically speaking, towards more conservative values. You know, I think there has been a big movement in that direction to a certain extent. And yet being plant-based eaters, that has traditionally been a more left-wing thing. It's been surrounded by left-wing people. And, you know, so I look at people like Louder with Crowder, for example. You know, I really enjoy his commentary on things that are going on in the world right now. But at the same time, he has been one of the major proponents of this, basically this disinformation that vegan parents are killing children and that it's dangerous. Uh, and so I've really enjoyed, in some ways, moving in that political direction to the right, but then maintaining this plant-based lifestyle. Uh, and it's been very, it's been very much a balancing act, very much about like just being myself. And so, you know, I'm interested in, you know, what did you see the other day? What propaganda have you seen in terms of the dangers of, of you know, giving birth to children who are made of nothing but plants? Yeah, well, I, I saw the story, someone shared the story. And then I saw, um, you know, I follow a lot of people who don't think the same way that I do. Right. Um, one of which is Sean Baker, the carnivore guy, yeah. um, you know, like nutritionally, he's like the, the other extreme. Um, and I follow him just out of, you know, to, again, keep my mind open. What is this guy saying? Most of his posts, to be honest, are just jokes and just like, you know, parody comedy stuff. Uh, but in any event, he shared that story and just like, you know, the v another death in the vegan cult or something like that. Um, so, you know, I think that we're really in an interesting time because, you know, that in, in this kind of great awakening, for lack of a better phrase, um, you know, people are realizing that there's powers that are trying to control how they live and um, what they put in their bodies. And, and these same powers, of course, want people to be vegan and eat like, you know, you know, um, plant-based, you know, synthetic meats and bugs. And even though bugs, I guess, aren't vegan, but like, there's all, there's this whole narrative of, you know, oh, Klaus Schwab wants to take your steaks away. So you got to like eat steak and rebel. Right. And so it's interesting. And I, and I trust that you kind of are tuned in and feel it as well. It's interesting to be in this state of like, rebellion to the great reset or whatever it is to like you know to owning our body sovereignty and freedom um but also like kind of you know being like because like the the, the veganism is part of that agenda even though it's not the same it's not whole food plant-based regenerative agriculture stuff it's you know poisons pesticides gmos and all this kind of stuff um, so I think that it all gets lost, you know, all the nuance gets lost. It's like, you know, a lot of people think that a vegan diet is a soy based diet. And I don't, I don't know about you guys, but I eat very little, if any soy ever. Um, not that it's like a really bad thing, but of course, GMO soy is really toxic and harmful. Um, so in any event, like when people hear, I guess where I'm getting at is like when people hear plant-based or vegan or whatever, um, it, there's a lot to unpack just in that topic alone, because of course, veganism is more of an ideology it tells someone what you don't eat. It, it doesn't really convey what you do eat. It just says, I don't eat meat, fish, dairy, and eggs. Um, but what does that mean? You're eating beer and cheat in the, you know, like french fries or whatever you know potato chips whatever else um are you eating like soy curls or are you eating broccoli and beans and brussels sprout, sprouts and potatoes and you know brown rice like so so i think that you know just in the in the the nutritional conversation in general there needs to be more precision or nuance in the way that we are conveying uh terms and foods and you know for example one thing that is like one of my biggest pet peeves is just when people um use the macronutrient terms to describe foods right like oh what kind of protein would you like 
Um, oh, I don't do carbs, you know, like all of these things. And it's like, well, every, every food has protein, carbs, and fats. Like, unless it's a highly processed, refined food, you're going to be eating all of those, you know? So if we can be more accurate, precise, nuanced with our understanding and conversation around food, you know, I think that is a good place to start. Yeah, I'm like you. I, I follow a number of proponents of the carnivore diet because I'm very curious about that emerging right now and, uh, you know, some of the information around it. Like I know uh, Jordan Peterson's daughter is a big advocate for it. So, you know, she just really shares her story that by completely removing plants and only eating meat, she healed some sort of lifelong autoimmune condition. And, you know, that's where she's coming from. And it's an interesting thing to you know, to have a prominent person's health story uh, up on center stage like that, because a lot of people are still in that place where they're like, oh, well, if it worked for her, then I guess I should try that too. Uh, in in lieu of listening to one's own body. And, you know, I, I follow uh, a nutritionist named Simon Hill. Um, he's out of yeah. Australia, right? Plant -proof, plant -proof guy. Yeah, the plant proof guy. And, you know, he's been looking into a lot of the carnivore stuff. He, he personally is always trying to dish out the science that sort of debunks a lot of that. But one of the theories that I saw him posit that was very interesting was that uh, evolutionarily speaking, as a species, we have uh, we've evolved with the specific gut bacteria that transform plant fibers. And that when someone goes on an entirely carnivore diet, all those specific types of bacteria that were used to digest plant fibers die away so that all you have left in the gut is what is used to break down the meats. And so, you know, I found this very intriguing because that's sort of a totally new evolutionary path. Like, what does it mean, especially considering that the gut regulates so much of our immune system and our, our emotions and all these things? What does it mean for people to suddenly simplify and reduce the number of species living in their gut and uh, from his perspective that's not sustainable in a long term you know he feels that we evolved with those specific kind of bacteria with a lot of benefits in that uh, symbiotic relationship and that to sort of just drop that out of nowhere uh, should really be looked at long term and so you know I've been watching that very closely and uh I don't know, like I'm interested what your thoughts are on sort of gut bacteria and this whole experience with plant-based eating. Yeah, yeah, great, great topic, topic and question. Well, and first off, I would say for people who jump into the carnivore diet and have a resolution of symptoms, I would say that doesn't mean that you're healing your disease. You know, that's you're managing your symptoms with nutrition because I, I don't know about Michaela Peterson's experience, but if she eats broccoli or beans or a potato or something, she'll probably have a recurrence flare of symptoms, which means that there's something wrong, you know? So she's got this carnivore band-aid keeping things together, which, yeah, there's all sorts of natural band-aids that we can use. Um, and I, I'm glad that she's feeling well. I'm glad that anyone has a, a you know, resolution of symptoms. Um, and I always like to, you know, encourage people to think about how they could maybe feel even better, you know, and again, keeping their mind open to, okay, what's, what's next. And in terms of gut health and the microbiome, you know, my understanding of ecology is that any ecosystem is, the health of an ecosystem is measured by biodiversity, right. And, you know, diversity of plants, diversity of microbes in the soil, diversity of, insects and animals. And the same is true in our gut. You know, we, we measure gut health by diversity of microbes that are proliferating our intestinal microbiome. Um, so the, the way to diversify our microbiome is but to diversify the plants and the specific fibers that we are feeding them. Um, that's the only way we can't diversify the microbiome by taking probiotics because there's only, you know, in the best probiotic, there's like six or eight strains of a bacteria than, you know, X billion colony forming units. And we just swallow this capsule and hope that, you know, those guys, survive, but the, it's only six or eight strains. When we're talking about the intestinal microbiome, there's thousands, right? There's thousands of unique strains of bacteria. Um, so 
in order to optimize each individual's unique microbiome, because every person, you know, it's interesting that we're, we are 99.9% identical genetically, like our human genome is very much the same, but our, our virome, or I forget what the term is, our, our, our microbiome genome, the genetics conveyed through the microbes and happening in our guts are very unique and they are influencing the expression, the epigenetics of our human health experience. Um, so the way to optimize the individual nature of a person's microbiome is simply by inputting the proper ingredients, you know, for pr proliferation and diversification of that unique microbiome, which is just fiber rich, um, diverse whole plant foods. And of course, being mindful of, you know, the pesticides, the herbicides, the antibiotics that, and toxins that disrupt that ecosystem. Mm. Now, and Amanda, you had, you've had lots of experiences with antibiotics, like really, I guess, damaging your gut, right? But your sensitivity yeah. to that has always been much higher than mine, uh, which I find intriguing. You know, I think some people, you know, some people are much more deeply harmed by antibiotics, I guess, based on where their gut is at to begin with. Mm -hmm. Like what, when did that start for you when you first noticed that the, your gut was being affected by antibiotics? When I was a kid, I would always have horrible reactions, but then, it, you know, they were, it was a normal reaction at the time. It was considered a normal reaction and we didn't even have probiotics then either. So, or anything to offset. It was just, you take the antibiotics and then you have the, the effects of it. And then it, that's it. And then you're on antibiotics again and, you know, multiple times as a kid over and over again. Um, and of course, when, you know, during birth, the birthing process, that's when our microbiome is seeded, right? You know, so ideally through a vaginal birth, like the infant's microbiome is like the, the that's, that's where it gets its initial bacterial foundation. And then it's just building and proliferating and evolving and adapting from that moment on. And I like to, you know, kind of brief reframe the antibiotic um, conversation, because I think a lot of people have fear around antibiotics or just pharmaceuticals in general, which, you know, for sure, I'm not a fan of the phar of pharma, but of course I recognize the utility in the greater schemes of, or in the greater picture of like maintaining, you know, managing symptoms and whatever, but, you know, antibiotics, you know, they, they do kill bacteria, but I like to kind of, like I said, reframe it and think of antibiotics kind of wiping things out and creating a clean slate onto which we can proliferate uh, because we're never sterile. We're never like lacking all life in our gut. If we were, we would be dead. We wouldn't be able to live or breathe on planet earth. We need that coexistence with the microbes in our gut. Um, so I like to think about, you know, a course of antibiotics is just kind of like this cleanse for our microbiome. Um, and then after, of course, the antibiotics, we can just hop back onto our whole food, plant-based fiber, rich, diverse, natural food lifestyle, slowly integrating more and more diverse, unique plant foods and proliferating our gut bacteria and regaining that flora that was wiped out to some degree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you're right. There is like a, a huge amount of fear of surrounding antibiotics. And I think some of that, I mean, I guess some of that comes from the over prescribing of it, that they were just so drastically over prescribed that I think a lot of people ended up messed up and didn't have, like you said, the wherewithal to then go back to a specifically clean diet that's going to rebuild that, you know, it's really important. And, you know, I wonder right now, and I don't maybe you have a, a particular opinion on this, but you know, I'm looking at things from this sort of global consciousness perspective because humanity is suddenly in this big challenge together, right? There, there's this feeling that there was a global event and we all need to sort of rise up and you know, fight for sovereignty and freedom. And I wonder to what extent is the consciousness on the planet being affected by the way people are eating, you know, and how much is that either hindering or helping us move forward as a collective? Because I look at you know, if I'm going to look at it from a totally conspiratorial lens, then it's, you know, what if there is an attempt not just to make us sick, but to lower consciousness, to lower our ability to self-regulate, to have, you know, a healthy emotional system 
uh, you know, unfolding. So do you have any sort of larger perspectives on what's happening on a collective scale in terms of how that's affecting people's capacity to, to move forward into health freedom, into a greater awareness? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, you know, I, I definitely am more conspiratorially thinking thought minded in, in nature with regard to a lot of things. And, you know, I think that there is kind of deliberate poisoning. You know, I, I think that there is. And uh, whether that's just to kind of keep people sick or dumb down consciousness or both. I don't know, but I can speak from my experience <laughs> like a couple of days ago. I'm just, I was just, as you were talking, I was just thinking about a couple of days ago, I um, went for a hike with a fa with family and uh, I'm in the Rocky mountains in, in Colorado. And, and there's a hike that goes to the top of a ski mountain in the summer. And uh, we were, we were with family, like I said, um, two seven-year-olds and a three-year-old hiking up this mountain and of course their parents um my uh my my in-laws or my um my wife's cousins in any event we got to the top of the mountain like three thousand foot like a, a thousand meter climb for you canadians um and uh we, we there's a restaurant up there and i was like okay you know it's lunchtime i'm pretty hungry like i'm gonna eat some restaurant food and there was some some like vegan pad thai dish you know and of course it was cooked with canola oil or vegetable oil of some sort and i'm like you know whatever you know i eat out like once a month if that um i'll be okay and you know i'm not too neurotic with food you're not too hyper controlling but anyway anyways got the food and then we took the gondola back down which is cool like you know you hike up and gondola down and by the time i got down i was like like totally rain fog just you know, and it was not just the hike. I was, I felt poisoned and I was thinking, man, this is how most people feel most of the time, probably to some degree. Um, and when I don't feel good, you know, again, just speaking from my experience, when I don't feel good, I don't have the capacity to do all the things that I want to do. It's just self-preservation. It's just like taking care of my most basic needs. Um, so I think that in order to continue awakening, you know, we have to be healthy, right? We have to be optimally healthy. Our needs have to be met at like all on all levels so that we do have the energy, the bandwidth, the creativity, the force, the vitality to do the things, to be activists, to, to, continue thinking and being creative and finding solutions if we're just you know being poisoned and trying to wake up and you know go to work just so we can pay the bills um that that's not going to foster the 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 what we need for that kind of continued collective awakening so to answer your question, I think we are all being called to really take our health, health to the next level so that we can, you know, take consciousness, take life, take culture to the next level as well. Yeah, yeah, great answer. That's a really good story. It's very much, you know, resonates with my first experience with veganism when I first started going, uh, uh, when I started moving away from eggs and meat and dairy it was like emerging from a fog, like very much so. It was like, wow, wow, wow. I have been living in an absolute fog that I had normalized. And I think that's one of the trickier things, right, is the normalization of ill health makes it invisible to people to a certain extent. And if they haven't had anything in contrast to that, they don't even know what you're encouraging them towards sometimes. You know, like they don't know what they don't know. And I think that's, you know, that's tricky for a lot of people. Um, but I think it's the proper direction for everyone to move. Um, do you have anything that you wanted to, uh, to say before I jump into my next question? Um, yeah, I, I guess maybe for some people, for me, what helped was just understanding that my consciousness, my consciousness needs a home. Uh, and so if I have this sort of broken home that causes and, and you know like the downgrade in consciousness is to me like a survival response that your body is kind of like okay well we have to dysregulate slow down sort of the functioning of the organ systems and so that we can survive because mm. you know your body just wants you to survive but not yet like you were saying like 
you know, what are the possibilities of your vehicle, of your body, of your consciousness <laughs> when your body is healthier, when you're sort of, I don't know, more exposed to whatever health looks like for you. So that's sort of how I look at it now for myself. It's, you know, I'm not just thinking. I have sort of this body, this body that, you know, I think a lot of society has put a, um, so much importance on what we can think and what we can even create and do and invent and manifest um, with little concern for the fact that the body has to get us to all those places. Yeah. It's sort of the one that's driving us there. It's not just the thoughts that we have um, and the intentions that we have. So, yeah, 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 it's really true. It's really yeah. true. Like the the idea of the body as a vehicle that you want to tune up, I think is truly amazing. And and in terms of consciousness, I mean, I'll say that too, that meditation and spirituality, all of that opened up for me much more deeply when I moved into a plant based diet. I just naturally started going into what I can only describe as higher states of consciousness, uh, which was very interesting. Have you have you experienced anything like that? Like, do you regularly meditate or what, what has your experience been in terms of you know, opening up spiritually on the journey to clean eating? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. And to be honest, I think that the meditation kind of spiritual inquiry came first, if I'm not mistaken, in my experience, but very much so, you know, things co-evolved in terms of the physical, spiritual, energetic, emotional, intuitive stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I, I mean, after having so many conversations like this, can't help but know and trust that there is very much this like, you know, the, the body mind is one, you know, it's like, oh, people think, oh, I'm just going to do these mental exercises. Oh, I'm just going to go to the gym and do these physical exercises. And, but the fact is like, we are just a, a, a being, right. And the evolution of that being happens like, you know, you know, together, you know, it's like, as, as we clean things up, you know, I, I, the way I, I just think of, of it, like you were saying, Amanda, just like kind of this, this vessel, you know, and this, this um, body, and it's like, but, but our, our body is so much more than just the home of our organ systems, right? It's more than just our flesh and blood. And um, as we clean things up, and I like to think about it as kind of like taking away the the static, um, then we're just more tuned in, you know, we're more receptive to the energetics around us. And, you know, whether you want to call it intuition, or just alignment, or whatever, but you know, it's like, we take away all that kind of, again, the, the fog, the inflammation, you know, whatever you want to call it, physi physiologically, we take that away. And we're just more present, maybe, so that we're more awake to what's always there. I don't know. But um, I think that for sure, in my experience, there's been that co-existence of the uh, mental, emotional, spiritual growth and um, self-awareness with the, the physical health. Absolutely. And, you know, like I said, you know, I hear it a lot from a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about distrust in the medical system at large and, and the extent to which the mandates and the masking and all this has really caused a lot of people to distrust this larger sort of Western medical system. Uh, and so, you know, faith in that has been deeply undermined. I know that uh, I saw some some stats on the fact that all, all vaccinations have dropped like uh, since the mandates. Way less people are getting less of all the vaccines. So there seems to be a withdrawing from that system. And you also have a lot of professionals withdrawing from that system. You have doctors and nurses standing up and speaking out and they're being canceled or censored or they're having their medical licenses ripped away. So there seems to be a kind of like chaotic, even a, even a collapse in some ways of that larger sort of industrial medical complex. Uh, do you have any sort of uh, vision for what, what might be beyond that? Because, you know, I'm looking at this and it's like, what will it mean for for healthcare to be more decentralized uh, than it is now? And what will it mean for healthcare 
and, and wellness to be managed on these sort of smaller community levels. Uh, like, what do you see as that bigger system as, is exposed in its corruption and as, as you know, very well-educated medical professionals are leaving it and might end up somewhere else? Do you personally have a vision in your own experience for what that might start to look like? I don't know, 10, 10 years down the road, maybe? Yeah, hopefully it's not 10 years down. Hopefully it's yes. a lot sooner than that. But <laughs> but uh, I think we're all ready for it. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, it's funny because I... I want I wanted to be a doctor from a very young age, like when I was like in eighth grade, 13 years old or so I knew I wanted to be a doctor. And all I knew was conventional medicine. And it was like, I kind of idolized the conventional medical world all through undergrad and everything. Um, and yeah, it's interesting to have observed my, like this veil lifted and it's like oh my gosh this is just they're just drug dealers <laughs> you know, of course they're all very kind-hearted not all there's some there's some scoundrels in there but they're all you know generally very kind-hearted well-meaning educated smart brilliant people stuck in a awful system that propagandizes and brainwashes them and you know of course they've got a control of the whole medical education system um from the you know history of like the flexner report and just like the the medicalization of medical school or the pharmaceuticalization of the medical schools so my vision is really just kind of you know uh the, the collapse of that the collapse of that pharmaceutical industrial complex that has a control of everything you know people are not only seeing the corruption not only seeing kind of like the ill the the ill intent which i you know i i certainly see very clearly but more more people are seeing that but they're also seeing the simple lack of efficacy of medications medicines don't work at the very best case they manage symptoms for some period of time at a cost there are always consequences, call them side effects or whatever, that catch up to us. And then, of course, a lot of people get on another medication or two or three or five or 10 to manage the side effects from the drug that is controlling a symptom. Um, so people are realizing their drugs don't work. Um, so it's that kind of, again, kind of like the, the collective awakening to recognize what's going on in their body. And oh my gosh, you know, I, I talk with people every day, you know, people, I, I just want to get off this medication. Um, and, you know, it's not working for me and I've got these side effects. And I think that kind of grassroots movement, if you will, of just like people taking their health into their own hands um, is really what is restructuring the new system, which is simply natural medicine. You know, I don't know what, what else to call it, um, but I always like to remind people that doctor means teacher, literally, like that's kind of the root of the word doctor from docere, which Latin for to teach. And the way that I see it is that doctors are educators showing people how to heal themselves. Like that's what medicine is. That's what being a doctor is. Doctor never meant drug dealer until like the early 1900s when, again, like the, the pharmaceutical companies were established and controlled everything for profit-driven motives. Um, so it's just the, the collapse of that. And I guess, you know, you might look at it and say, we're going back in time 100 years or something like that. Uh, but the fact is that natural medicine has a lot of efficacy and um, not only just, you know, the the herbs and um, homeopathics even, and, you know, things like that, but, but just the lifestyle medicine, you know, um, the, what am, some of my mentors, or I guess they're not really mentors, but just the, the older, like they, they were dead before I was alive, but just kind of the older teachers of natural medicine, um, they, they were referred to as hygienists or high or practice hygiene medicine, which is really just about being clean, you know, living a clean life as, you know, one might say today, um, you know, being toxin free, um, you know, of course, food, air, water, toxicity is everywhere. So, so hygiene medicine from my perspective is, is really kind of the future, which again is, you know, ancient stuff, you know, it's not new revolutionary scientific stuff. It's, it's, uh, the, the science quote unquote, the scientism like that is leading us away from nature. 
right? We've got to kind of like, okay, science is cool. Continue doing the studies, continue looking at cells and genetics and whatever, whatever. But don't forget about common sense. You know, don't forget about what it means to eat, breathe and drink and hydrate and, and be on planet earth and just get back to the basics. And that's really, that's what my whole life and, you know, medical practices revolved around is just the, the basic common sense, low hanging fruit of lifestyle medicine that a lot of people are like, Oh, you know, sure. Yeah. Food is powerful, but really like hydration and breathing air like how can that really help me <laughs> and the fact is that it's the only thing that can food air and water are the only things that can heal you uh, because they are the things that contribute to the toxic load that makes us sick so we remove the obstacles we remove the stuff that's dragging us down you know the the canola oil or the vegetable oil in my case is the top of the mountain and like you know it's not like i need anything it's what I need is just cleanliness. What I need is just detoxification. You know, I need to just remove stuff. Um, so I'm going off on a little tangent, but that, you know, that like the, there's just this, this, uh, like we're all programmed to think that we need something outside of ourselves, whether it's on the supplement aisle at a grocery store or, you know, being, you know, um, sold in someone's Instagram stories or, or whatever it is. It's like, Oh, What's going to make me look better, feel better, think better, have brighter skin? Like, what is it? You know, and, and it's like, no, it's not out there. We need to like turn that thinking off. That is, we've been hijacked. <laughs> you know, that's not where the answers are. The answers are like literally what we're doing moment to moment, day to day, when it comes to just our basic fundamental, you know, lifestyle habits. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Very, very well put. It's funny how simple it is, actually. It's quite ridiculous <laughs> how far in this direction that it's gotten. <laughs> you know, uh, in, we were watching uh, a Tucker Carlson segment last night on, you know, the, the most recent shooting that, that occurred. And, you know, he, he made some great points. It's something that I've known for a long time, but it was interesting seeing this on mainstream media that the majority of these shooters are young boys who were put on psychotropic pharmaceuticals uh you know who were set up with some sort of therapist and they were all put on high dosages of these pharmaceutical drugs that literally say on the box that they cause like explosive anger mania suicide like those are side effects of the medication these young men are on uh and they're supposed to be on them to stop those things from happening and when you pull back and look at how those medications have increased by something like 3,000% over the past, what was it, like five or 10 years or something? It was... Yeah, it was a, f a few years. It was just a long. few years. It was so yeah. incredible. It was a 3,000% increase. And you see that <laughs> along with this 3,000% increase in medicating young men, uh, you have the rise in shootings and things like this. And it's just the way that health is being managed right now is so insanely backwards it's so far from like you said just being clean just living a simple clean life and and knowing that our bodies are meant to be healthy they're meant to thrive they're not meant to be constantly like struggling with illness necessarily you know like i think everyone has varying degrees of challenge in their life path but i think there is a certain amount of thriving that is built into the body that is so simple that it's kind of invisible to to people who are a little bit lost in this i don't know medical industrial complex pharmaceutical industrial complex that has sort of shrouded our culture uh it's a very very interesting time to be watching that shift even for people who are maybe doing more of a carnivore thing but they're they're also including more plant-based whole foods you know some people are they're doing a bit of both and the of fruit. course, they're, you know, they're seeing better things, which is good. Like, oh, if I eat a little fruit, I feel better. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anyone. Oh, it's cool. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll do that now. But yeah, when we're, when you were talking about the, the shootings and, and I was talking about the cleanliness and just like the common sense, you know, I would, I would take that to the next step level and say that kind of basic common sense cleanliness detox lifestyle, like just natural life also translates to our, you know, mental and emotional relationships, right? So, so many people have toxicity bombarding them through 
computer screens, through relationships, through the way that, you know, they're, they're, they're seeing what they're seeing in video games and movies and propaganda and listening to, and the, you know, rap songs and this and that, and the mind control. And so it's like, we need to be mindful of all this. And again, I, I think that there's, again, I'm, I'm more conspiratorial in nature and think like there is some deliberate, like, let's control these people and create, create chaos and pin them up against one another. And just then, you know, everyone's discombobulated and then we can come in and provide all the answers and control things. And, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and um, we need to opt out of that. You know, we need to opt out of that and we can by just simply decluttering <laughs> decluttering and that's obviously easier said than done it's easy for me to sit there sit here and say that um i don't have the the answers or solutions when it comes to like you know inner city problems and just like you know all the the, the real the real things but i have the vision you know yeah right on right on uh do you have any anything else that you wanted to add love any other questions i don't think so yeah nothing's coming to mind in this moment yeah I think uh, I think that that was really the the the, the meat of the meat of what I wanted to get to <laughs> the beans the beans the, beans. the coconut meat. Uh, so um, where where can people find your work and tap into what you're doing and what you're offering? Uh, you know where where do you live in the in the interwebs? Yeah, well, you know, I I always. I, I think I take it like day by day in terms of my presence and life on the interwebs in terms of social media stuff. I'm not like very consistent in my Instagramming or anything like that, but my Instagram is a uh, DR Benjamin Alter, Dr. Benjamin Alter. And I guess, you know, for people who want to learn more about what I do besides share Instagram stories, um, you know, you can find me at www.alter.health. Um, that's how we kind of work with people. We do seasonal cleanses, which is a kind of a good, easy way into kind of, again, having the experience of what it feels like to clean things up. And a lot of people through that experience of a seasonal cleanse sustain this lifestyle. That's the purpose. You know, I think a lot of people have this relationship with cleanses and detoxes as just kind of this yo-yo thing. And that's certainly not the point that we bring to it, you know, so hopefully it's a, an educational experiential experience that, you know, people can sustain. So that's our cleanse. And then we've got a program that's a lot deeper in education around whole food, plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine called Thrive on Plants. And um, that's how we generally support people in, again, taking control of their own health and healing themselves. Uh, we're the doctors, we're the teachers, but you know, each individual is the healer. So that's what we do at Alter Health. Right Incredible. on. Right on. Well, thank you for joining our, our conversation so around the, the right diet. We have a couple people lined up, so we're going to be doing this as a series. So we really, really appreciate your contributions. Cool. Yeah. And uh, I, I appreciate what you guys are doing and uh, look forward to staying connected and tuning into all your awesome content and podcast episodes. Thank you kindly. Thanks.